welcome to you online to Faith Centennial United Church, where Jesus Christ is Lord. What a whirlwind holiday, eh? Like, whoa! Between the winter storm just before Christmas and worship on Christmas Day and New Year's Day, which only happens like once whenever the stars align and the planets line up, right? Like, I feel like I've lived a whole year in like the last 10 days. Like, I've lived like an entire 365 in just the 10 days. Um, I want to say a big thank you to all of you who were kind enough to uh, uh, bestow upon me a gift for the season. Uh, so I thank you very much. I appreciate all those gifts very much so. And your generosity warmed my heart over those colder days. Also a big thank you to the session team uh, for handling last week's service. Yes, fantastic. If you want to applaud that, that would be fantastic. They did a great job. Um, you know, it takes a lot of courage to get up here and to, and to speak and to talk about things, to sing. Um, it takes a lot of skill and courage to do that, to organize worship. So uh, I'm really grateful that they could step up and uh, take over for a Sunday. It was fantastic. So a new year is here. We are in a week into 2023. New year is here. And uh, we're bringing some changes also to how the service uh, pans out here at Faith Centennial and some other things. So uh, we've got communion today. We've got a few changes in our service, which I'll touch on later. You'll see those coming up. But uh... The first reading is Psalm 72, verses 1 through 7, uh, read responsively. Endow the king with your justice, O God, the royal son with your righteousness, The mountains will bring prosperity to the people, the hills the fruit of righteousness. He will defend the afflicted among the people and save the children of the needy. He will crush the oppressor. That was their line. Go yeah. to the next one. You're probably right. No, I'll just keep going. Number five. He will endure as long as the sun, as long as the moon, through all the generations. In his days, the righteousness, righteous will flourish. Prosperity will, aban will abound till the moon is no more. The second... Wasn't there. Huh? Wasn't on my list. Okay. That's cool. That's all right. Isaiah 60. Okay, Isaiah 60, verses 1, one six. through 6. Yeah. That's it? Yeah. You're sure? Okay. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> the glory of Zion. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look about you. All assemble and come to you. Your sons come from afar, and your daughters are carried on the arm. Then you will look and be radiant, and your heart will throb and swell with glory. The wealth on the seas will be brought to you. To you the riches of the nations will come. Herds of camels will cover your land, young camels of Midian and Ephah, and, from all, and, and all from Sheba will come, bearing gold and incense and proclaiming the praise of the Lord. The third reading, Matthew, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Okay. Visit of the Magi. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judah, during the time of Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, 
he was disturbed, and all of Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people, people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them, where is the Christ, where, asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem and Judah, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people, Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them exact, the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go to and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over a place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the host, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their home country by another route. This is the living word of God. Let us pray. Mighty God, we thank you for your holy scriptures. We do not know what we would do without them. They are a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway. And when we forget them, we forget you. O oh God, this is your revelation of who you are, of your directives to your church and your people. It behooves us to study them, to dig deep into them, and to find out what you are saying to us. So help us today, O oh God. We want to hear the Holy Spirit. We're trusting. We're praying in the Spirit. And we ask in Jesus' name that your Holy Spirit would illumine these pages that it fill the words of the preacher and the listener alike, and that we may know that today we have met with the living God. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The classic story following Christmas time in our tradition is of the wise men who travel to see Jesus after he's born. In fact, that great old chestnut we just sung, We Three Kings, outlines this scriptural story perfectly in both melody and verse, reminding us of the power of music and faith flowing together. It bears knowing the finer points of it. Herod is the ruling figure in the land, and from the east comes three wise men into Jerusalem who have seen a star, a sign, shining brightly in the east. And they recognize this to mean that a king has been born, and not just any old king either. But Herod, jealous of this threat to his station, takes his chance to search out this rumored king to cut his life short, thus securing his own position of power. Herod is introduced to scripture's prophecy of Jesus, confirms its accuracy with the three wise men, and instructs them to find the king so Herod could also worship him. The three wise men head back out, following yonder star, eventually coming to the stable in Bethlehem to find their prize and they offer their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They head home, being warned in a dream not to report the whereabouts of Jesus to Herod. For a biblical story involving the Messiah, a big old prophecy, wealthy agents from another country traveling afar, and oppressive, oppressive regimes and political leaders, it's a beautiful moment, but it's also pretty mundane. Prophetic moments in our scripture often confuse or amaze the people around it. We can think of moments when Jesus foretold his own death on the cross. The disciples were confused. They were dismissive. No, Jesus, you're not going to die. You're the Messiah. You can't go anywhere. Don't worry about it. Moments when peoples from other countries come into our scripture are often surrounded by war or aggression. We can think about when Egypt came to power and enslaved the Jews under Pharaoh's reign or the Philistines through judges. 
Stories about our Messiah in the world are usually filled with lavish and reality-bending miracles. We can think of water being turned into wine, uh, Lazarus being brought back from the dead, or fig trees being withered just at the command of our Savior. But here, in this story of the wise men, we have all three of these elements, and it's actually a pretty smooth and beautiful ride. Right? Like, it's almost entirely uneventful. Almost. Because the focus here is not on action. The focus is not on pivoting the story. The focus is not on changing the history or the fate of a people. The focus is actually on Jesus and his royalty. Now I know. Royalty, right? Like, that's an odd term. Some of you might be thinking, like, humble, meek, and mild Jesus, right? He's an infant, right? He would never think of himself as such. He's helpless. He's an infant. He's poor. Born to these parents, born in a manger, in a stable, crying, needing his parents' help to get along. How could this be royalty, right? And yet, three wise men, three men with enough wealth to gift a baby with gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Three men able enough to travel great distances. See Leaders, political leaders that are important people come to the baby Jesus calling him king of the Jews. Well, that seems like royalty to me and probably perhaps by any other definition. Now we can spy in the first chapter of Matthew's gospel, which we did not read this morning. The lineage of Jesus is royal enough. He comes from the line of David, who was in fact actually king over Israel some hundreds of years before we can see throughout scripture until his birth, God delivers prophecies about Jesus, about the Messiah coming, and uses terms like prince, and describes Jesus as ruling, judging, and comforting all royal duties and stations by any standard. However, royalty occupies a very awkward place in our lives, especially today. We know that throughout history that royalty was the highest station in life that one could possibly have. Royalty meant that you lacked for nothing. You had power to command and control entire peoples. You probably had military might of some kind. And unless you encountered a stronger nation than your own, you and your children and your children's children were probably set for a few generations. It's all going to be fine. Royalty was the default way for most nations to rise and exist and perhaps even fall. By royalty, the rest of humanity lived and breathed. Eventually, royalty began to change. It slowly phased out as the default method of leadership. Governments were established with many uh, leaders in charge of smaller positions and different capacities. We know this leadership style. We experience it today. It's called democracy became quite popular around the time of Christ through the Greek and Roman influence over the world. Some places like China, Russia over there, you know, they, they refused this influence. They kept their leaders under different names, kings under different na labels. But royalty shifted. And eventually royalty became more about social status than ruling the entire nation. Today, a few bastions of royalty still exist. We can think of the British royal family. Uh, but they hardly rule the United Kingdom, right? Like the closest they come to influencing large masses of people is through like Instagram or Twitter, right? Like it's social media, right? You know, celebrities occupy the same space as royalty now. If you're a good singer, uh, a decent actor, uh, an okay artist, uh, a creative chef, you might grab a piece of royal status for yourself, right? You'll be spoken of highly in social circles. Uh, you'll have your name or your face plastered over uh, advertisements and commercials and products. And people will flock to see you when you turn up in public from your palatial estate, wherever it happens to be. This is, in our day and age, how we treat royalty. And I wonder if I ask you here today, like, who is royalty to you? Like, when I say, who is royalty, what comes to mind? Who comes to mind? Anyone? Okay, yeah, Queen of England, royal family, yeah, anyone else? Oh, there we go, you answered my next question. Man, Mari just spoiled the surprise for all of you, eh? <laughs> Good job, Mari, good answer. <sighs> I'll just skip the rest of this page right here. <laughs> 
You know, I was going to say, like, would it be like Taylor Swift or Bette Midler, Johnny Cash, right? Vincent Van Gogh, Gordon Ramsay, Sean Connery, Dick Van Dyke, Prince Harry, John Wayne, Albert Einstein, Billy Graham. All those people are all famous. They're all kind of royalty within their various circles. But would the answer ever be Jesus? Right? The truth is that while Scripture describes Jesus as royalty... We tend not to, actually. We tend to think of him as a savior. Yes, for sure. We got that down pat. We know that Jesus, uh, we, we express that Jesus died for our sins. Uh, his sacrifice ended that sacrificial system. There's no more blood for blood. and We can be forgiven just by asking God for it. Uh, we think of Jesus as the son of God, for sure. We got that down, no problem. We know that God sent Jesus. We know he is the son of God and the word made flesh. Uh, through Jesus, all was created. He is the light, and God is well pleased in his Son. Uh, we know that Jesus is teacher, for sure. He taught us about God. He showed us the face and the will of the Father, instructed us how to love one another, preached to us of miracles and redemption and repentance. But we rarely, if ever, expound on the royalty of Jesus, like the three wise men. They journeyed far, going entirely out of their way of life. Far from their comfort zones, their lofty homes, and their lavish lifestyles to bring spectacular gifts for a new king they didn't even know, having seen the sign of his birth in the sky. The wise men risked life and limb to appear before this royalty the absolute minute that they received the sign. But more and more in our age, I mean, we're hardly going to make a 20-minute drive to go praise Jesus on a Sunday morning. The three wise men are not described as Jews who would have a vested interest in making good with their king. They're not described as prophets who would want to connect with Jesus to help spread the word of God and lead God's people. They've come to honor the royalty of the king. They say expressly that they have seen a sign that the king of the Jews has been born. And they want to worship him. They do this by offering their best gifts before him, sharing time and stories, and departing to spread the word of what they have found. Because that is the wise men equivalent of social media and advertisements and product placement. And what's your version of that today, I wonder? Like, are you treating Jesus as royalty in your life? I mean, I think you know this as much as I do. The best marketing is word of mouth, right? The things and people and experiences that we talk about in our day-to-day -day lives are the stories that people take with them into theirs. If you talk about how you had this amazing experience at a restaurant where the food was just absolutely tasty and perfectly cooked and the staff were kind and attentive you didn't, never even had to ask for an extra water they were just there all the time keeping her full right and the price was absolutely affordable thank god right praise jesus chances are whoever you tell that story to is going to want to go there right in fact you probably expressly told that story the reason you told it is because you want that person to go there you started that story with hey have you seen this restaurant that i went to let me tell you about it right have you ever told someone a story about Jesus like that? Like a good restaurant? Have you ever brought an offering like that of gold, frankincense, and myrrh to Jesus? Now, I'm not saying you have to bring those things to Jesus. We know that God doesn't actually require those things for you to express your passion and love for Christ. But how we treat Jesus and how we think of Jesus makes a big difference. If Jesus is just a sideline character in your life, if Jesus is just there when you need him absolutely for advice or for, you know, a shoulder to cry on, well, that's a very different life than if Jesus is royalty to you. If you treated Jesus like some people treat the royal British family, right? Think of how that changes your relationship. There are people who gob over that family, right? Every word that they put out, they're just hanging off them. And if you hung off every word of Jesus like that, if you treated his word as life-giving law in your life, and I know a few of you do, well, now that changes everything, doesn't it? When everything else comes secondary to the wisdom of Christ, 
and the presence of the sun in your life, the whole world changes around you. Teacher, son, Messiah, these truths we know and honor for sure. But let's also begin giving Jesus the royal treatment, looking to him for our next move, waiting on his word for our wisdom, and honoring his life as one we should imitate always. And in this, your life will change entirely. Amen. You are all ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through you. Let all you do be done in love.